But uh, this hour we can also live on two three on Facebook, the SFA channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. I am out for the concert tonight. We continue to stay on the domestic debt exchange program as it keeps changing faces every moment without any end in sight. Tonight, we interrogate the numbers that make up the over 80 percent subscriber base as reported by the government that approval rate plus the reaction of the former chief justice sophia kufo to gabi asari or and this latest outburst about the decision by the former chief justice to join the individual bondholders who are pensioners seeking that their pensions be totally exempted from the domestic debt action program also students of the Invest of Ghana clash with security officers earlier today at the Invest of Ghana campus over matters relating to accommodation. We understand some 18 students have been picked up already. We speak to authorities of the university on how they are dealing with the situation which has become a security threat according to the university authorities. Stay with us. We'll give you details. Also still on the security matters tonight, persons living near the Burkina Faso border live in fear and panic following a destruction of a terrorist camp in Burkina Faso. We gauge the mood on the ground and also speak to a security analyst on the development. Stay with us. We're live on TV3 Gun on Facebook, DSV channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. But we are very, very, very interactive. Let's hear from you. The hashtag is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get talking. Well, let's settle for Ghana Briefs. Former Chief Justice Sophia Kofo has clapped back at a leading member of the new patriotic party, Gabi Asariotu Dako, who criticized her for joining pensioners to picket at the Minister of Finance to demand an exemption from the government's domestic debt exchange program. She described the president's cousin as a disturbance not worth her attention. He doesn't decide for me what I need to do and what I do not need to do. It's as simple as that. I, you know, I don't have time for things like that. People like that are not important to me or to my life. It's a disturbance. I've grown to the age where I've seen it all, and therefore I easily become suspicious. Gabi Ochiridako can call me paranoid. I don't care. We're talking about people, we're talking about human beings, we're talking about people who have served this country and have served well and served hard. Not easy service. Some members of parliament have questioned the finance minister's hesitance in appearing before the House. Kenneth Riata was expected to brief members on the debt action program today, Tuesday, February 14. I think the disrespect, the disdain that Ken Ufuriata has shown, this parliament is just becoming unacceptable. This is not the first time. This is not the second time. Neither is this the third time that he disregard the directive of parliament. The reason why parliament invited him to have a discussion with him on the matter that he is dealing with is because of the nagging issues. Even if he were to come today, he has already announced the achievement of 80% meant for the IMF program. So. What we need to do still is to understand what actually he, he has done with the program. Because people are still agitating. You find that uh, even today, 
uh, the senior citizens are still at the uh, Ministry of Finance picketing. His excuse for not coming today is untenable. I don't know why he is not appearing today. Um, I've just been told that he'll be coming on Thursday. I hope that when he comes on Thursday, he'll give us um, uh, more details of this DDEP. And then I'm sure subsequent to that, there'll be debate in the House, probably referred to the Finance Committee, where we could do the, the grilling of the figures that will be presented to us on Thursday, hopefully. The majority leader in Parliament is demanding from government the immediate inclusion of the treatment of hepatitis B on the National Health Insurance Scheme. Deputy Majority Leader Alexander Penyomarking in a statement to Parliament says the figures from the Ghana Health Service point to unborn babies suffering from the effects of the virus from their mothers. Estimate from 2020 Ghana Health Service press release on World Hepatitis B Day showed that an average of 120,000 newborns will be exposed to hepatitis B virus by their mothers during the delivery, and up to 90% of these newborns may end up being infected. The Ghana National Council of Private Schools is alleging that government and the West African Examinations Council, WIAC, are giving candidates of public schools advantage in the school placement system. According to the executive director of the council in Ogjetwa, BC candidates from private schools are being marked down. If government is capable and come out openly by solving the low standards in the public schools, by introducing 30% allocation, all because to solve those low, uh, low standards, then it is equally admissible or presumable that there might be a different marking scheme for the private schools. President Kufuado says prioritizing investment in early childhood education is critical to education development of the country. He made the observation when he commissioned ICT KG Model School at Kwabinya in the Greater Accra region. Education is the most effective way to change the fortunes of our continent and country and join the group of developed nations and continents. Thus, prioritizing investment in early childhood education is critical to the education development of our country. There's fear and anxiety among residents of border towns around Paga in Ghana following a reported destruction of a terrorist camp near Po a major commercial town by Burkina Faso's military. According to Burkina Faso's information agency, the camp was destroyed on Monday night. He doesn't decide for me what I need to do and what I do not need to do. It's as simple as that. I, you know, I don't have time for things like that. People like that are not important to me or to my life. It's a disturbance. That's all I've got to say about it. Now, the way things are going, I, I, what I sense and what I smell is the creation of two categories of people or two classes of people. Those who have been exempted by, by the issue. I think doctor was very uh, clear with the, the, the distinction. Yes. And then now they are calling those who have, those who refused to sign on to the debt exchange. I'm not going to understand the former Chief Justice, Sophia Kofo, if you don't appreciate or understand the implications of the self-exemption option, as Dr. Edwana Nienchi explained. But also, more importantly, you will not actually appreciate the former Chief Justice, Sophia Kofo's position and her association 
and the sentiment she is expressing, if you have no empathy, no, no sympathy, you, you lack an appreciation of the plight of the aged in our society, probably because you are disconnected from the realities that people face as a result of the benefits that you get from your association with power. You know, sometimes when you hear people talk and you realize that clearly they are blurred from the realities that we all, that you and I, you watching me face, then that influences some of the statements that we hear. But that is the only time you'll question why they are on this path. I mean, why would you not have any human feeling for our elderly like this? Now, I want you to take a look at this. Dr. Samuel Amakwe. Dr. Samuel Amakwe. And um, how old are you? I'm 81 years old. You're 81 years old. Um, medical doctor? Medical. I was a medical practitioner, private medical practitioner, and retired in 2017. You retired in 2017. And, and you decided to invest? Yes, because I know I had a kidney problem. And it's already at the end. And it will come to a, to a, if it will come tomorrow, any time. You are invested for it. That's why I bought, I bought, I bought bond. He's preparing for what is going to happen to him because he's living with a kidney disease, a situation. So this investment in government bonds is not only it's not even coming in to for him to enjoy it's actually cautioning him against the repercussions of what he's going through the only guarantee for him staying alive this is the 81 year old he is a reflection of the realities of many many people but that said there were concerns about whether government could actually achieve the 80% approval rate that the ministry itself set for this domestic debt action program. Well, that's gone now, at least, per what the finance minister told us today in the statement. I have a copy of that finance ministry statement indicating it has successfully swapped. They swapped over 82 billion. It's almost, that's about 82 billion, 994 million. I think 510 CDs, 128 worth of old bonds from a possible target of about 97.7 billion under the domestic debt exchange program. That's according to the statement they issued earlier. But questions were asked about what was the details of this? I mean, how many bonds were tendered in and so on? We got, we got a copy that details the categories of the bonds that were tended in. There's a little over 82 billion bonds that have been swapped now for the new nine, almost over 97 billion series bonds. This is it. You may not see it, but when you go on 3news.com, you get the details. Yeah, a long list, long list. In fact, they have the government of Ghana eligible bonds in there somewhere. The Esla bonds, some of it were tendered in. And then you have the Dachi, Dachi bonds that were eligible as well. Some of them tended in long one, long one. And the maturity dates go as high up to 2039. And then also the principles that were tendered in and accepted. All of it is in this document, which I'm going to make available. You can, uh, right after this, go on 3news.com. We'll publish this full date, the details of this statement and the bonds that, according to the finance ministry, was tendered in. And the total you see here, that's the total of a little over 82 billion. That is some 84.9%. 80, as against the target of a little over 97 billion that you, you see there. Right? So that is what they put out earlier today, long list, right? They say it represents an amount that's about 84.91 success rate, exceeding the finance ministry's own intended target of 80%. Now, 
the critical matter in this announcement that we, we saw earlier by the finance ministry is not so much about the approval percentage as communicated by, by the ministry, but whether this over 80% success rate reduces our debts to sustainable levels for us to get the attention of and the approval of the IMF board. And, and this, I've been speaking to some people who are close to the IMF home negotiations and how the IMF works. That's their position, that yes, you might have achieved over 80% approval rate, but how does it reduce your debt levels? Does it make your debt levels now sustainable for you to get the attention of the IMF? One other concern is what we may have sacrificed in achieving this approval rate within record time. Remember us at November this year, we understand the public debt was about 571.4 billion. We don't know the true figure in the state of affairs now because that 571.4 billion was at us November 2022. But as to what we sacrificed to get this over 80% DDEP within the record time of a little over two months, because remember this was launched on December 5, 2022. Because if you look at other countries that have gone on this path, at least we checked this is data you can find the source is the imf go on their website it's 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 something that when you put in the right data you can get the right outcome on the imf website but this is what we found out ghana the restructuring scope year completed 2023 the duration for this domestic direction program a little over two months We've seen now, as communicated by the finance minister, more than 85, or almost 85% approval rate. You see Argentina, domestic, same debt exchange, or the restructuring of their domestic debt when they went to the IMF in the year 2020. They took 11 months. They got a 99% approval rating. Barbados also had the domestic debt restructured in 2018. They took four months. 100%, you have at least, you see Ecuador, Chad, Grenada, Mozambique, Ukraine, Uruguay, all taking between 5, 17, 32 months, 33 months, 11 months, 6 months to achieve between 99 and 100% approval rating. So there's something to talk about when it comes to the time it takes because it gives you a lot more time to engage all the stakeholders properly so you can address their concerns and get their buy-in. Well, that, that was not done. We've seen this. What are the implications of this going forward? Because the, the aftermath of this domestic tech action program is going to be our focus in the coming days. How this will impact on the financial sector, how this was also going to impact on the confidence that you, the public, all of us have in the investment in government instruments, all of that. Stay with me. Another issue is whether these individual bondholders trust government enough to actually pay maturing bonds at the set date. Lawyer Martin Pebble joins me. We have a few people sharing their thoughts on this as well on Ghana tonight, right after this quick break. Stay with us. So uh, this statement today doesn't answer our concern, and that's why we are asking on government to stop the shenanigans. Stop the shenanigans. It's abuse of office. You taking money from poor citizens. It's time to pay. You are not paying, and you will say nothing to them. It's okay. abuse of office. It's abusing the citizens, contrary to Article 36 of the Constitution. How can the government bully and abuse citizens like that? Come mm. on. What kind of poor, very abysmal governance is this? I've never seen anything like this. Now, a government is assuring persons who and I'm sure you, you fall in this category of people who refuse to 
participate in the Just Ended Domestic Debt Exchange Program, that you will be paid your outstanding coupons and maturing principles. Do you have, per the statement, any trust and confidence because of the non-payment of your maturing bonds already, just about a week ago? Yes, so we don't have confidence in this statement at all, especially when you look at it in the context of the people making the statement. When you start with the president, you remember his 18 notable quotes that I've referred to a few times on the key points. 18, I'm not corrupt. I will not steal your money. I'll use the Anas principle. I'll protect the public purse, etc., etc. I have to 18 of them, which he has breached willy-nilly. When you come to Ms. Oforiata, the same thing, you see, uh, even as part of this program, the, uh, the president said there will be no haircut. Today, we are having head cuts, heads, not just hair. The whole head is gone, right? Yes, Ms. Oforiata promised the same. He repeated the president's promise. Individuals will not be affected. Today, who are the people being affected? So if you look at the U-turns they've made, the chameleon-like posture they've adopted, changing colors willy-nilly, and, and then coupled especially with the fact that the bonds that matured last uh, Monday, so February, have not been paid, mm -hmm. nobody will take solace in this statement they've issued. So if you go and you start picketing next week, Monday, and the ministry calls you and says, you know what, we've captured it in the statement, which I have a copy of, that we are assuring you that we're going to pay your maturing bonds, but we have extended it by the payment by another week, so as to, as per the statement says, to try and then understand, properly process the settlement of the new bonds. What are you going to do? Well, uh, Mr. Cassidy, that one, then we will take it back to our members and then look at it. That's why I'm saying. So if a definite date was given after okay. this uh, February, perhaps our members will look at it. But right. I see because, as I told you, these people can't be trusted. You see, they are not committing to any specific date. That tells you a lot. Tells you a lot. And Alfred, we should be mentioning the way government is treating us and increasing tension in the system. President Kufado should remember that the Arab Spring he spoke about in opposition. That Ghana was headed for an Arab Spring because of unemployment, because of hunger, because of uh, desperation, because of all the other ills he mentioned. What's uh, happening now? Today they are west. So by his own logic, we are headed for the Arab Spring. So he better watch out. Okay, so by Monday we'll see what between now and then whether there's going to be any further detail from the ministry, but you made it quite clear. You don't have any confidence in the statement that they have made. Well, Martin Pebble, I thank you very much uh, for your time on Ghana tonight. Appreciate it. He is the leader of one of three individual bondholder groups, also a private legal practitioner. But there's a statement from the, the Bank of Ghana because yesterday, we spent some time talking about the Bank of Ghana and their decision to finance the 2022 budget of government by some $44.5 billion. And some of the concerns that the former finance minister said Tepe raised, they issued a statement today. And that's what you see on the, on the screen there right now. It says that, in fact, the IMF has appointed Leonard Chumo as a financial advisor to the Bank of Ghana upon request. Now, funded by the Switzerland State Secretary for Economic Affairs, the resident advisor is expected to provide technical assistance and help build the capacity of the banking supervision function in the country. The emphasis is on the banking supervision function. This press release from the Bank of Ghana indicated that the advisor's placement is a continuation of cooperation in, in this area between the Bank of Ghana, the IMF, that started as early as in 2015 and had already seen the assignment of a previous advisor until 2018. 
according to the Bank of Ghana, the previous advisor made some contributions and achievements which make the current assignment imminent. But the likes of the Honorable Isaac Adongo are raising questions about whether indeed this financial advisor came in either upon the request of the Bank of Ghana or the IMF's own observation of what happened over the period and why the Bank of Ghana needs this. But this is the official statement from the Bank of Ghana. Well, this is Ghana tonight. Stay with me. Now, we have been staying the steam on how things are playing out uh, with the domestic debt exchange program. So we'll see how the coming days will look like. But the police, who understand, have arrested 18 people believed to be former members of the Kumo Hall of the University of Ghana, Legon. The suspects, according to reports, clash with police officers at the forecourt of the hall after they tried to access the facility earlier today. Uh, the former residents of the hall have been protesting what they see as management silence on the accommodation crisis already and Accra High Court has placed an injunction on the implementation of a new residential policy by the school's management to end student clashes. So that's what happened at the University of Ghana campus earlier today. We, we have some blurred pictures of um, about four of the 18 students who have been arrested as a result of the disturbance today. Uh, um, but that's, that's what happened earlier and the police's own statement on this. Also, we have a copy of the court injunction that the students say uh, they secured against the investors' decision to, as it were, implement the in-out-out-in policy. That copy of the injunction we'll put on the screen shortly, uh, so you'll you see it uh, there. And those are the details of what we do have about the happenings and what went on with respect to the University of Ghana, Legon. But let's go on to the telephone now. And uh, Professor Jumpo is a professor of political science at the University of Ghana, Legon. Uh, most importantly for this development, he is a member of the academic communication team of the University of Ghana. Professor Ranswell Jumpo, thank you very much for joining us on Ghana tonight. The students have been showing me uh, the interlocutory injunction which they secured to reside in the hall which we'll put a copy on the screen shortly. But have you, the authorities of the university, been saved? Well, thank you very much. I think um, we were informed, uh, we heard about a certain injunction that had been um, given way back last Thursday. And um, I think as of this morning, even up to afternoon, the university had not received a copy of that injunction, but I think just before you called, a uh, person I uh, was drawn that just late this evening, uh, we had a copy of that injunction. But are you, from what we are understanding, what briefing have you, the authorities of the university, had concerning what happened earlier today? The videos have been showing. I don't know. Um, you see, it is these acts of lawlessness that 
that tends to vindicate the very tough decisions that the university has taken. And I want to let you know and be emphatic that so long as this lawlessness go on unabated, the university would remain resolute in taking tougher decisions to create an atmosphere of peace, to create a congenial and conducive atmosphere for learning. We would do all we can as a university to protect and safeguard human life and property. I mean, look at this. If you have gone to secure, the university has looked at various acts of lawlessness and clashes between some student groups that have led to the destruction of property and then human beings have been injured. People have suffered various degrees of injuries. We've had parents calling on us, crying, and pleading that we take certain actions, otherwise human being, human lives will be lost. Based on that, the university has gone through several of its decision-making structures to take a decision, and this decision these decisions have been sanctioned by the governing council of the university, and they are being implemented. Now, if any student, any grouping outside campus, if anybody outside campus or within campus believe that they don't agree with the rules or with the, with the policies that are being implemented by the university, you are free to go to court, and they have gone to court. We have met them in court. And the substantive issues are going to be heard. But as some have said that well before the substantive issues are heard, they want an injunction, which they claim has been, uh, which they, they are telling as they seek. And like I said, just before talking to you, my attention was drawn to the fact that an injunction has been um, um, given. Now, if injunction is given, is it a duty of uh, a group of disgruntled people who to go enforcing that injunction? Do you take the law into your own hands and simply say that you have received an injunction and so we are going to take, we are going to do whatever it is, whatever suit us to enforce the injunction? Is that a jungle? If an injunction has been given and in your mind, you don't know what your authorities are doing, but in your mind, in your failure to think, about the fact that authorities have also got the right to appeal against the executive fact they have the right to, to file a, a motion of stay of execution of injunction you don't even know this and let's assume that you think that the embassy is not complying with the injunction what do you do alfred don't you go to court to cite the investor for contempt and allow due processes of law to take place it is not a jungle it is a law, a law, a, a, a society that is guided by laws. And so the point must be made that the days where some people allow themselves to be used by others outside campus to cause confusion on campus and to send shivers down the spine of people um, uh, um, are long gone. The caliber of people who are running the University of Ghana now are not cowards. They will do everything within the confines of the law to safeguard and secure life and property. And we would not condone or countenance any act of lawlessness. We would take on any student and anybody who tries to disturb the peace of the university. And we will make sure we work with the law enforcement agencies to deal with them. While the law enforcement agencies are dealing with them, we would also activate our own internal disciplinary processes to also deal with them. Now, when that happens, I call on parents. Many parents are not aware of what others are using their children to do. You see, there are people outside campus who are not part of the university. Uh, of the university, they have kept their children out of the university. They have safeguarded their children. 
and then they are working and manipulating other people's children to incite them to cause, you know, acts of lawlessness on campus. I appeal to the state and parents, and I caution them that if they don't speak to their own words, and at the end of the day, our, our own internal disciplinary processes catch up with them. We will not yield to any plea from them. And so I ask them to speak to their own children, and they should be mindful of the kinds of things that some are doing. There are some of them, we speak to them, very innocent, we understand. And yet, you don't know what happens. Some people manipulate them, and today we are told as many as 18 of them have been arrested and they, they are behind bars. I see. Well, the yes, anyway. internal design processes of the university will also be activated. Because as we speak now, there is a ban on possession on campus. But would, at what point, for example, would you, the authorities of the university, consider the decision that the court has taken on this matter as contained in the injunction that the students uh, today indicated that they had secured, which you have indicated as well that you, you the authorities on the university, you've seen and have actually been served a copy of? Let's note this, please. Let us let us be let us be practical about this. One of the reasons why the university is fighting um, even the court order is that we believe that maybe um, the, the real facts of the matter were not brought to bear. You know, were not were not um, articulated or were not really listened to, and that's how come we are killing. Look, a policy initiative or policy decision has been taken and is being implemented. And before that policy was implemented, the university went out of its way to provide accommodation for all residents, continuing students, residents of Commonwealth Hall and Minister Sabah Hall. We provided that accommodation for all of them in our UGL hostels. About 95% of these students from Commonwealth Hall and Minister Sabah Hall accepted this accommodation and some of them their parents called us asked whether they, they should pay and then we gave them to the go ahead that well it's a hall that we give it to them and so they should go ahead and pay and they paid now in the commonwealth hall and in the main sasaba hall and we have recruited we have admitted fresh students we have 100 students we have admitted them there and so you can just imagine a student from Saboba, Chiriponi, a student from somewhere who has never been in Accra, he has no family member in Accra, he doesn't know anywhere, doesn't know anybody in Accra, has been admitted and he's, he's been admitted to Commonwealth Hall. Now we are being told that, and then today we heard that the Commonwealth students said that we were going to beat them up and eject them. I, is it possible that we can suddenly eject students who are already in accommodation and then, and then, and then and, and then throw them out there and then bring in students from Commonwealth who already have accommodation in the UJ hostel. And then um, what what do you think what do you think will happen? Are you imagining the confusion that will be created? We've already collected their uh, money and then we've made use of their money. How, how are we going to refund their money to them? And if we are able to refund their money to them, how are we going to accommodate, provide alternative accommodation for them? We can't do that. And so they are already in accommodation. It is going to be impossible for us to drive them away and to bring other people there. It, it, is, it is going to be practically challenging. And so we are battling some of these issues in court. If that will help us to create the con a conducive and continual learning environment, that is what we want to do. And as you may be aware, since we opened up so now, we found that atmosphere until today, that some people said that, well, the court has given an injunction, and so we are going there to enforce. It's, act, it's an act of lawlessness. And I'm saying it is particularly because of some of these acts of lawlessness that, that the university tends to be vindicated in the kinds of decisions that it has taken. And let me make, it, let me make that point again clear, that the caliber of people leading the University of Ghana are not, are not cowards. We are willing 
defend every policy we have implemented and we are willing to speak right. to the issues and we are willing to take on anybody who feels he has a challenge, he wants to challenge us. We are not cowards, we are not afraid of anybody who will speak on the issues and will stay on the issues and will defend every policy that we have initiated and we are, we are implementing. Okay, Professor Jampo, oh, thank you for your time on Ghana tonight. Professor Jampo is a pol professor of political science at the University of Ghana, Legon. He is a member of the academic communications team of the University of Ghana on this matter. And we've also taken notice of the Education Committee of Parliament's interest in what's happening now. Uh, that's Dr. Clement Park has also just indicated right now. They are watching how things are playing out. But there's fear and anxiety amongst residents of border towns around Paga in here in Ghana following a reported destruction of a terrorist camp near Po, a major commercial town, that's what you see on the screen there, by Burkina Faso's military. Now, according to Burkina Faso's information agency, the camp was destroyed yesterday night, that's Monday night. These are pictures from uh, Po, uh, which were secured uh, a journalist based in Navrongo, near the border town of Paga, Senyala Castro has been giving us a sense of the situation and why it should be a matter of concern to Ghanaian authorities. Take a look. In Po, just like Paga, speak the same custom language. Due to several similarities, the people between the two towns share health facilities, education due to that, there's a free movement of people from Po to Paga and vice versa. Ghana's borders at Paga continue to be porous. And so residents are calling on the government to deploy more security personnel to the border communities and also increase surveillance. Residents have also been appealing among themselves to begin to report suspicious characters that they see within our communities. To uh, the Ania Kuo Hillary, the assemblyman for Kajelo electoral area in the Kasena Nankana West District Assembly in the border town of Paga, he is saying that the people live in fear and panic as we speak. My electoral area from my electoral area to where the attacks happened this afternoon, that is Po, is about 20 kilometers. Actually, when we got the news that this attack happened, there was panic in town. Because we saw the information on social media, people were friends from Burkina Faso were calling us that this is happening at their side of the country. And we are very close to them. So my appeal to government is to deploy more security to man our borders because if you look at our border is a porous area if we don't deploy more men we don't know when it will happen to us i also urge the stakeholders in town the stakeholders around all the electoral areas close to the border to also be up and doing because people are now living in fear people are living in panic and we don't know when we pray that yes God is always uh, with Ghana, God is always with us, but we need to protect ourselves first. So we try to plead to everybody as the national security uh, agenda, see something, say something, so that everywhere we go, there should be information so that we can be able to prepare ourselves. Yes, there is panic. People have so many fears to go around to do business in town. But what do we do? We are our neighbors. We just ask government to deploy more security to town so that we can live in peace and we can live in harmony and there will be happiness back because a lot of people are just calling. What are we going to do? Situation there, um, we understand a paga. We have our eyes on that. But former director of the West Africa Network for Peace Building, Emmanuel Bombande, he said that Ghana is not approaching the threat of terrorism with a modern security mindset. He said more needs to be done in preparedness to avert any imminent attacks. 
you spoke earlier to my colleague Pakos Yasari. I think that we are not measuring up enough to the level of the threat in terms of our visible preparedness to deal with the threat. I think that we are still operating with an old mindset in which what we are doing are the silos of our borders. But increasingly, our borders have simply become artificial and are not relevant in terms of how we are responding appropriately to the threat of terrorism and violent extremism. And so before we talk about the deployment of sufficient troops along the borders, we need to be strategic in terms of the level of cooperation with our neighbors that makes the borders to be insignificant in the fight against terrorism. We'll keep an eye on that and be updating us all on how things play out there. Thank you so much for staying with us here on Ghana tonight. On behalf of the rest of the team, we appreciate your company. I am Alfred Okansi. Have a good night.